hearing capacity of the entrance door will be monitored by the sergeant of arms who will allow people to enter in the hearing room based upon seating availability. Persons waiting to enter the hearing room are asked to observe social distancing, wear mask covering, face covering while waiting in the hallway or outside the building. building. The legislature does not have the availability due to HVAC system projects of an overflow hearing room for hearings, um, which attracts several testifiers and observers. For, for hearings with a large attendance, we request only testifiers enter the hearing room. We ask that you please limit or eliminate handouts. The committee will take up bills in the order posted on the outside agenda. Our hearing today is our public part of the legislature process. This is our opportunity to express your position on the proposed legislature before us today. The committee members might come and go during the hearing. This is part of the process as we have bills to introduce in other committees. I ask you abide by the following procedures to better facilitate, facilitate today's procedures. Please silence or turn off your cell phone. Please move to the reserved chairs when you are ready to testify. These are the first two chairs on either side of the first row. Introducer will make initial statements followed by proponents, opponents, and neutral testimony. Closing remarks are reserved for those introducing senator only. If you are planning to testify, please pick up a green sheet that is on the table in the back of the room. Please fill out the green sheet before you testify. Please print, and it is important to complete the form in its entirety. When it is your turn to testify, give the sign-in sheet to the page or to the committee clerk. This will help us make a more accurate public record. If you have handouts, please make sure you have 12 copies and give them to the page when you come up to testify, and they will distribute those to the committee. If you do not have enough copies, copies, the page will make sufficient copies for you. When you come up to testify, please speak clearly into the microphone, tell us your name, and please spell your first and last name to ensure we get an accurate record. We will be using the light system for all testifiers. You will have five minutes to make your initial remarks to the committee. When you see the yellow light come on, that means you have one minute remaining, and the red light indicates your time has ended. Questions from the committee may follow. No displays of support or opposition to a bill, vocal or otherwise, are allowed at a public hearing. The committee members with us today will introduce themselves, starting at my right. Good morning, Senator Carol Blood, representing District 3, which is Western Bellevue and Southeastern Papillion, Nebraska. Again, I'm Rita Sanders, District 45, the Bellevue Offutt Community. John Lowe, District 37, Kearney, Gibbon, and Shelton. Steve Heller in District 33, Adams in parts of Hall County. Uh, John McAllister, District 20, Omaha. Thank you. To my left is Legal Counsel Dick Clark, and to my far left is Committee Clerk Julie Condon. Our pages for the committee today are John Laska, um, senior at UNL, and there should be another one. Ryan, yep, he's there. Ryan Koch, Ryan is a senior at UNL as well. And we are ready. Nope. Oh my gosh, I have another whole page here. <laughs> Do we need to read this? Uh, I think we're good for um, Senator Blood, LB8. Thank you, Senator Sanders. And good morning to Senator Sanders and the entire government, military, and veterans affairs committee. My name is Senator Carol Blood. And again, I represent District 3, which is Western Bellevue and Southeastern Papillion, Nebraska. And thank you for the opportunity to bring LB-8 forward to this committee. LB-8 is an effort to help curb what is known as electioneering, or dark money in state elections. It's clear that there are gaps in Nebraska's current statute that enables dark money, special interest groups, to place influential ads that may sway voters during elections without knowing who is behind them. The bill in simple terms is about accountability and transparency. Two things that I know you as elected officials not only support, but also know that most of your constituents also have the expectation that we will rise above dirty politics and to make available any information that helps them to be informed voters. 
LB8 requires the reporting and disclosure of electioneering communications. These communications are targeted at the electorate of a candidate or ballot initiatives that are distributed in the 30 days preceding an election. These types of communications touch on the ballot measures or the candidates without clearly recognizing the, the election, their candidacy, or the official name or number of the ballot initiative. Because of this, they do not have to report, be reported under our current law. LB8 does not limit or restrict the activity or voice of these citizens groups or what they say. Again, I want to repeat that because this seems to be what people whine about every year when we talk about this. LB8 does not limit or restrict the activity or voice of these citizens groups or what they say as it is stated in some of the opposition letters. That needs to be really clear. We aren't violating their constitutional right to free speech as many of the opposition letters have stated. The only thing this bill does is create a very simple reporting mechanism that allows for greater transparency and accountability to our state's elections. This mechanism is much like every person and organization must adhere to when they participate in electioneering. If powerful and well-funded organizations decide to pump money into Nebraska's campaigns or elections in our state, it is paramount that Nebraskans know who it is because they deserve to know. In fact, in a national poll facilitated by Reclaim the American Dream, 66% of Democrats, 62% of Independents, and 61% of Republicans want disclosure on all campaign spending. Opinion polls continue to show that the public favors clear rules and a level playing field. I can't count how many Convention of States testimonies we have sat through that continually point out that they are sick of big money in elections and they feel it does help people in their elections and helps to keep them in office even when they are doing a poor job. LB8 requires any person or co-op, co excuse me, LB8 requires any person or corporation who makes an electioneering communication in an amount of more than 250 or $1,000 respectively to file a report of this communication with the Nebraska Accountability and Disclosure Commission, just like everyone else. I'll note that these aforementioned provisions actually mirror the requirements for late contribution reporting for candidates. I'd like to address one of the letters of opposition that I found to be quite humorous, and that they tried to say this bill had something to do with union officials and their political allies that are trying to silence groups like theirs. Unions are 501c5 organizations, and they report their campaign and ballot initiative spending publicly. So I ask myself, and I ask you, what do these organizations that come out against this type of legislation really have to hide? Why do they want to fly under the radar when they are the ones spewing hate, misinformation, and outright lies? And why do they continue to get away with putting out false narratives about other organizations and these types of letters to try and influence you? I think we all know the answer to that question. Election, electioneering materials defined in the bill are any communications that are publicly distributed 30 days immediately preceding an election when that communication refers to a ballot question or a clearly identified candidate is directed at the electorate of the office being sought by that candidate or by the voters who will be voting on that ballot question. The actual loophole in state statute is where it says groups and individuals are not required to report communications that are intended to be educational. Now, ne'er-do-wells have used this loophole to distribute communications and to avoid reporting on ads that are obviously directed at or allude to a ballot question or candidate and that advocate for or against this ballot question or candidate. So for clarification, we are talking about paid broadcasts, or mass mailings of a thousand pieces or more. Now, we all know that some of these ads identify the name of the candidate or ballot question, but don't mention the upcoming election. They get very creative in their language, but it's clear the purpose is that you should vote for or against the issue or the candidate. There are a long list of problematic ads over the last few elections, from Medicaid expansion to state senate races here in Nebraska. 
The subject matter in the ads were clearly urging no votes from the electorate, but no true transparency was available to the public so they could understand who was responsible for these ads. Now, I'm sure many of us in this room also had these types of ads used against us in our own election cycles. This is an issue with both parties, and they are both using it to their advantage and will continue to do so unless we close that loophole. And I can't stress enough how important it is that campaigns, voters, and those supporting ballot issues have the ability to be made aware of who is involved with this type of campaigning in the last 30 days of an election cycle, that they should have open access to anything that will affect their position in an election. Now, some of our opposition may say that 30 days is too small of a window of time to turn in this type of reporting. I counter that by saying that if you or I receive a $1,000 donation, we have 48 hours to report it. It's not rocket science. This concern doesn't hold water because I'm sure Frank Daly can better explain. We all have paperwork and reporting that is due in small windows of time, and we all manage to get it done. So let's talk about only a smattering of these problematic, problematic ads. In 2016, in the last 30 days of an election, there was an organization called Trees of Liberty. That organization singled out three Nebraska senators, which they had the right and the ability to do, but it was an organization that most people had never heard of and trying to gather information was difficult. We know they'd been active in Colorado and Iowa, but were basically what I call a hit and run organization where they come in, they do the damage, and then they disappear. The damage they do is usually filled with half-truths and outright lies, which again, is their right to do. But you, remember, you may remember the group called the Alliance for Taxpayers who came out of New Hampshire not even from Nebraska, to run ads on Medicaid expansion. And then these organizations just disappear almost as quickly as they come into our state. And we never really know truly how much money was spent. But it's a candidate's right and the voters' right to know who puts out these ads, not only because it's a logical and ethical thing for us to do, but to allow them to put up a fair fight. But let's be honest, this isn't about anything ethical. It's about being unethical. They often do this by creating a 501c3, which is an educational nonprofit, so they don't have to identify who they are and how they get their money. Again, I understand that these types of communications are a constitutional right. However, it should be reported in a manner similar to all other communications that are used in our state to influence elections. If we require disclosure for electioneering communications, we tell Nebraskans that we value the opportunity to give those who are attacked or misrepresented the ability to respond publicly to the groups behind these misleading ads. Now, I'd like to point out at this juncture that communications that are truly educational in nature are excluded from the reporting requirements in this bill. This would include voter guides, much like the League of Women Voters puts out, a candidate debate communication, um, a candidate debate communication for any news story or editorial or communication by a membership organization to recognize its members, or a communication while the legislature is in session about a specific bill that is pending. So friends, this is an opportunity not only for this committee, but for our entire body to step up to the plate and uphold the integrity of Nebraska's elections. We don't change what communication can be sent during elections or what messages will be relayed. All this bill does is close a long open loophole that allows special interest groups to the ability to avoid disclosure. They do this by hiding behind the language that allows for the distribution of educational materials. The purpose of this bill is to ensure that activity that is identical in purpose and pretty much identical in form gets treated in the same fashion in state statute. We are asking for something very simple. Who are you and how much are you spending? Why are we excluding this group except to fight dirty? We expect unions, corporations, candidate committees, associations, 
limited liability companies and other entities that make contributions and expenditure in support of opposition to a candidate to file reports with the NADC saying who are they and how much they spent. In LB8, general purpose contributions won't show up on any report. The group not name and the amount that group spent would be disclosed. Were there a violation of the law, the NADC investigation is confidential and additional information only re revealed if the commission finds based on the evidence that a violation has occurred or if the person who is the subject of the investigation requests that it be made open. And knowing that we have this option to pass legislation to help Nebraska voters see who is behind the big money in our elections, and that we refuse to debate these bills and allow this type of electioneering communication to happen because they don't say vote for or vote against, or that they portray candidates in a particular light, be it good or bad, and that is not necessarily true, and that they don't have to answer to anyone. Oh, and it should be noted that when we brought this subject up in, legis in past legislation, these same groups come and oppose or write the exact same letters trying to instill fear, and we cave to them. So my question for all of you today is, are you okay with this? Because I'm not, and your constituents aren't okay with this. This is not a left or a right issue. It's a good governance issue. This is also not a Nebraska issue. At least 22 other states have some form of legislation built to root out dark money spending. Judge Scalia stated before his death that requiring people to stand up in public for their political acts foster civic courage without democracy is doomed. For my part, I do not look forward to a society which, thanks to the Supreme Court, campaigns anonymously, hidden from public scrutiny, and protected from the accountability of criticism. This does not resemble the home of the brave. So tell me, when have we had enough? When will we be done tearing apart our democracy? When we ask those who hide behind these funds to let others know who they are, it does not violate their free speech, and it is certainly not going to be a panacea. We need to end this legalized corruption. It may be a small step in bringing Nebraskans all to a better place where we can work together and get back to what is important. And what is important is that we know all who are involved in our campaigns and that we all work with an even playing field when we run for office, regardless of your party. I constantly hear words thrown around on the floor about ethics and integrity. If you truly feel that way, why do we never, never vote these types of bills out to the floor to debate? What are we scared of? So I do hope you do the noble thing, the right thing, the truly ethical thing, and vote this bill out to the floor for debate. I don't have high hopes that it will be debated this year, but having it in the queue for next year gives me hope that we can bring this issue to light for all of Nebraska to hear. In closing, my district has the most veterans of any district in Nebraska. When I walk out my door and look down my block, I can tell you three-fourths of my neighborhood are either retired or active duty military. We as Americans celebrate these men and women who served or are serving our nation and our armed forces so that we all may enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as our Declaration of Independence promises us. Chief among those liberties is the right to vote, which underpins our democracy. All who have served understands his or her role in protecting this most vital of interests. This lack of transparency undermines their hard-won battles veterans have secured over the decades. When you attempt to influence an election, it is the epitome of indifference. It is wrong, and don't fool yourselves into believing that they don't see what's happening and that many believe it is wrong. With that, I will close, and I would be happy to answer any questions, but I would add that there are testifiers that are available to answer your questions on NADC reporting and other issues, and suggest you wait for my closing in hopes that your questions will have already been answered by folks more experienced in this area than I. Thank you, Senator Blood, on your introduction of LB8. Are there any questions? See none. We'll go on to uh, testimonies. Are there any proponents?
<laughs> Looking for my glasses. Good morning and welcome to the Government Military Veterans Affairs Committee. Thank you and good morning, Senator Sanders and every, everybody else who happens to be here on the committee. Earrings and masks do not, and glasses, they're not, <laughs> just not a good fit. <laughs> uh, I'm Linda Duckworth, L-I-N-D-A-D-U-C-K-W-O-R-T-H. I am co-president of the League of Women Voters of Nebraska. And I'm in Senator Paul's district, in case you care. Um, we sent, uh, the, the League of Women Voters sent a letter to this committee on February 25th expressing our support of LB8. In part, it reads, the League has identified several factors in the financing of political campaigns that impact political equality for all citizens. Representative democracy should not be distorted by big spending on election campaigns. Voters should be provided with sufficient information about candidates and campaign issues to make informed choices, including transparency in the use of money to influence elections. Candidates should be able to compete equitably for public office. The truth is, we are dismayed that so much money is spent on campaigns, that it is even permissible to spend appalling amounts of money, but of course that is an issue for another day, or maybe another decade, or even maybe for another century, I don't know, but it's not for today. Um, this bill addresses what can be addressed, and that is the dark money special interest groups and the electioneering they engage in, and the time frame in which they engage. Our League members are folks, mostly women, who work for better government in various ways and have been for 101 years now, uh, been around for a long time. Uh, our activities include registering voters, organizing debates and forums, writing the questions for our voters' guides, or writing letters of testimony in favor of or in opposition to legislative bills. You are probably aware of that last example since we have submitted quite a lot of testimony this session. Members also work on other types of committees, of which we have several. At the moment, we have a Money and Politics Study Committee, and this is a group of patriotic, morally upstanding women and men who are wholly committed to making democracy work, let me tell you. They work me to death. I let them know, I, I did let them know I'd be testifying today and ask them for feedback from their experiences as voters, but also to ask others, such as neighbors and friends, people who generally don't find the time to pay attention to politics uh, for their take on campaigns and campaign spending. So I'm talking about kind of the average person. The feedback was 100% the same. Citizens throwing up their hands in disgust at, first of all, the proliferation of ads, second of all, the nastiness of the ads, and lastly, the sneakiness of the ads. Well, there's not much we can do at this point about the proliferation of communications of all types, I might add. If people want to donate money to candidates and PACs, they have that right. The nastiness of the communications is here to stay, too, at least until it no longer works, and I pray that will be soon, uh, because our First Amendment protects speech, whether it's civil in nature or not. When it comes to the sneaky aspect, though, referring to who is spending that dark money to possibly, probably, most likely, mislead the voters about candidates or ballot issues, that one, you, members of the Government, Military, and Veterans Affairs Com Committee, can actually do something about. You can choose to advance LB8 to general file for full floor debate. If candidates and political action committees are required to disclose to a point who their donors are and how much money is spent, it is only right that some accountability and transparency be required of the so-called educational, and I say so-called because to me they are pop-up groups, I call them pop-up and pop-in groups uh, also. You know, you can probably imagine how resentful I might feel as a part of an organization that's been around for 101 years, how we have got this long, long history, and for our voters' guide to be ignored, or not, but, but for it to be overshadowed by, by just the 
so much uh, negative stuff that's coming out that's often not even true. Anyway, um, it, it is disheartening to see the piles of ads put out by mysterious groups from who knows where with where there are no names attached. LB8 is not a gigantic step in the direction of good governance by any means, but it is a simple step, and since this bill is really quite unobjectionable and very obviously about honesty and integrity, you should support it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions? Senator Halloran. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Sanderson. Thank you, Ms. Duckworth, for being here testifying. So a lot of times... Uh, campaign expenditures are funded by various groups and I and I'm not confident that the public knows the source of funding for those groups uh, for example can you can you uh, do you have any kind of an idea who uh, funds preserve the good life I so an ad didn't. comes out from preserve the good mm -hmm. life and that's what's mm -hmm exposed on the ad paid for by Preserve the Good Life. Does the public have any idea who funds Preserve the Good Life? That, that's a great question, and it's one I've been pondering recently, too. And I, and of course, I should know the answer, but I think that... Well, I'm not trying to trick... That's not a trick. No, I, I don't think that. that to be a trick question. I wouldn't expect yeah. you to know. But, but I guess the issue is, and the question is, if, if there's an ability to funnel money through a group that has an, a fairly innocent or innocuous name like Preserve the Good Life, which mm -hmm. is a very positive name, mm -hmm. sure. it, it, it should be clear to the public who funds that right. fund, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah I think And maybe, it's, maybe, it, maybe it's there, and I'm sure Senator Blood will correct me on this. But or perhaps, you know, our Nebraska Accountability Disclosure Commission. Right. Yeah, people want to dig into right. that, they can find mm -hmm. find that out. And I would like to know too, so I hope you will ask that and, and we'll get that information. Because uh, I'll tell you, I, as, as I was walking down here, I ran into Neil Erickson, who, um, as most of you know, used to be in the um, Secretary of State's office and is now in a different position here. And we were both sort of lamenting that, that um, the law that we had back in the day that not only limited it it, it, it put some limits on uh, donations actually but I think it also you know what I'm not sure about the disclosure how much uh, disclosure of who was was donating mm -hmm. so I think that was so ask that question too when you get a chance with sure. I guess another question is and it's it's uh, at some level um, some of these campaign ads clearly can get pretty nasty I understand that but some of it's in the eye of, the eye of the beholder, right? If I'm a candidate and I'm running for office, and I've been in office for four years, and and the campaign ad exposes uh, my voting record, and they may say it in a disparaging fashion, but they clearly spell out what I, issues I voted for, I voted against, mm -hmm. in order to sway or influence the voter. Is, is that dirty campaigning to expose someone's voting uh, record? I think it depends on how it's stated, right? Because you, because there's you voted in a certain way, you voted for or against a bill for a reason, and there's probably it's probably a long paragraph or several paragraphs why you voted that way, and that's not going to be on there. So that it, distortion is. But there, nevertheless, there's nothing one can do. You know that right. is that is the right of, and so I, what I'm what we're saying is who is who is saying this? Who's putting this out? Right. And maybe we can ask those people more questions about why did you say this? How just you know can we can we hear more? Can we learn more? See, as a candidate, I'm not a, I'm I'm not uh, personally affronted uh, by an ad that exposes my voting record, and then I have the opportunity then. Uh, with the public, it may take more effort, may take more money on my part to do that, but that's okay. I mean, it's it's part of my obligation, I think, don't you believe there's a case as a candidate? I do. To uh, explain in detail why I voted yay or nay on some particular issue. Don't you agree with that? I do, and I'm glad you brought that up because that also uh, brings up to me that 30-day window because you, and of course it depends on how much money is spent, but nevertheless, 
um, that's really all that this bill does. It's like it's. I'm okay with that. Um, I think the the uh, so-called education, you know, the 501c3s, they should be required to do that reporting to, to be disclo disclosing the same kind of types of information that you have to as a candidate. At some level, I think the public's a lot smarter than we give them credit for. I really do. I, mean, I think so too. Uh, even on the specific issues, mm -hmm. um, I think the public can tell, and you can agree or disagree, I'll put it in the form of a question, don't you think the public can tell uh, on a specific issue, even though it's a one-liner, it may be just the, the description of the bill, um, and, uh, that what that issue's about and, uh, and have some kind of an opinion on that, personal opinion on that, and judge based upon that. It's based. It's our. Uh, it's our um, responsibility as senators when we uh, uh, have bills to describe them fairly accurately in the title of the bill, so people can clearly know what it's about mm -hmm. without a lot of study. Mm -hmm. um, but don't you think the, the, the public generally has uh, is, is smart enough to figure most of that out? I think so, and at the same time, I think that. We are all we have all become busier and busier in our lives, and that the a the average person is not paying paying as much attention as they would like to. And so, yes, they can suss it out, but at the same time, that could take a little bit of time. And so many people don't find that time. I, I understand that. Well, I appreciate the Le uh, League of Women Voters. They, there was uh, a meeting last week in Hastings, mm -hmm. and they dealt with the issue of convention of states. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that was great for them to have a meeting on that very important topic. Although I found it odd they didn't invite me, the state senator who has sponsored an Article 5 Convention of States for the last four years, to attend that meeting to put input into it. You didn't even receive an invitation? No. I will ask them about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Senator McAllister. Yeah, thank you, Senator Sanders. Isn't it true, Linda, and thank you for being here, that we're not talking about the message. We're just trying to disclose who paid for that message. Would that be the correct way to say that? That would. But at the same time, um, I did kind of go on about the message, so I did. Yeah. yeah. And having been in nine elections myself, I, I know about the nasty ads and the half-truths, and, and, mm -hmm. and that's disappointing. How many states have adopted a similar law to this this particular bill? Well, I believe that Senator Blood said about 22. Is that, uh, so I, I, otherwise, I'm not really sure. You um, would have to ask her. And so that it's, they, they try to provide better disclosure than, than uh, what we currently provide. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, and it's good to see you again. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Are there any other questions? See none. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Are there other proponents? Senator Sanders and members of the committee. You say you have the best cleaner here in the whole building. You said that the last time I was here. So, uh, my name is Al Davis, A L D A V I S. I don't have any prepared testimony, and I'm just here on my own. Um, wanted to hear what the dis dialogue was going to be and what Senator Blood had to say about this bill. She made reference to the 2016 election. I was one of the three people that was targeted. Uh, she, she had referred to the Trees of Liberty. In my case, it was the Americans for Prosperity, not the Trees of Liberty. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clarified. Um, <clears throat> I think what we're really talking about is how money is used. We're seeing that all these campaigns really, it, it amounts to just how much money you can put together and you just bombard the populace with mailers or uh, radio ads until they're browbeaten into uh, into making decisions. 
Most of the voters that I know are just absolutely fed up with these mailers and things, but they do have an impact, and everybody knows that uh, we all hate negative campaigning, but, you know, the old saga is, but unfortunately it works, and so that's that's something that I think needs to be talked about. Um, in 2018, I helped manage uh, Senator Brandt's campaign. I don't know how many of you are aware of what happened to him, but this was in the primary. Shortly before the uh, uh, primary, there were, I think, $30,000 worth of radio ads bought attacking him and Senator Dorn for, you know, some of their positions. So, you know, the only way for them to respond to that is they need to go out and raise in another $30,000 to do that. So, you know, we're, we're talking about basically letting money dictate how we're going to have our elections. What Senator Blood's bill does, in, from my perspective, is it says, well, at least, at least we're going to see to it that the names of these people who are making these contributions are reportable so that people can see who they are and where they come from. Um, you know, and I sort of said this in jest when I was writing this down, but, you know, supposing there was a group called the Nazi Party of America that was putting out mailers against you, Senator Sanders, or, or someone else, you know, I think we'd all be outraged if that was the case, but if it's somebody like Americans for Prosperity, that sounds good. They're trying to dictate campaign in rural, remote legislative districts in Nebraska, but they're also doing the same thing with county commissioners in some places, you know, mayoral candidates. Um, so for the, in the interest of disclosure, to me, it just absolutely makes sense that that the candidate has some ability to go in and see <clears throat> where this money's coming from. Because, you know, in, in the case of Brandt and Dorn, it was a it was a, a 501c4 out of, um, I believe, Roanoke, Virginia. So no connection to Nebraska. But, you know, they wanted to stir the mix here and try to try to make something dip, something else happen that obviously didn't. Those guys won and, and they're good senators. Uh, so that's all I have to say. I think it's a good bill. I think that it's long past time that the legislature uh, took action on these issues. And let's let's join the other 22 states and put this on the record as, as a good law. Thank you. Thank you for testimony. Question, Senator McAllister. Yeah, thank you, Senator Sanders. Good to see you, Senator. Thank you. thank you. Do we know who the contributors to Americans for Prosperity are? I don't believe so. Um, I, we tried to find that out four years ago, and, and so there's the national organization, and then there is a state association. I think this was done by the national. It's been a long time ago now, so it's hard for me to remember. But How about the Trees of Liberty? Don't think so. So they mask themselves as educational groups, so by that vehicle they have, don't have to disclose who their donors are? Is that That's the correct, works? yes. And what is that called, a 501c3? No, it's C not a c3. I think it's a, is it a c4? Okay. I'd really have to check on that, Senator, and then we'll do that. Okay. I think it is a c4. I think you're correct. Um, and this bill would, would uh, if any group spends any money in Nebraska, they have to disclose their donors? Yes. They, they would, you know, just the, just the same as anybody that makes a late contribution to a candidate's campaign, that has to be disclosed by the candidate. So you're trying, you're really setting up rules for these entities that are no different than what we're doing for people today. And you can't mask the, you know, who your donors are if, if you're a C4 on this bill. I don't believe so. Okay. I think, I think Frank Daly will be able to give you more information on that. Thanks, Al. Thank you. Any other questions? See none. Thank you for your Thank testimony. you, Senator. Thank you. Are there other proponents? Good morning, Senator Sanders and members of the Government Military and Veterans Affairs Committee. My name is Frank Daly, F-R-A-N-K-D-A-L-E-Y. I serve as the Executive Director of the Nebraska Accountability and Disclosure Commission, 
and I'm here today to express the Commission's support for LB-8. LB-8 really does one thing. It requires the disclosure of the amounts of money spent on electioneering communications. In order to understand this bill, you really have to understand the concept of an electioneering communication. So consider what regularly happens a couple days before an election. You get a brochure or a mailer, and it says something like this. Senator Jones voted to raise gasoline taxes. Call Senator Jones and tell him that Nebraskans don't need higher taxes. Now, you receive that in the mail and you consider it to be a campaign ad. Senator Jones considers it to be a campaign ad. The sender intends that it will affect your decision as a voter. However, the U.S. Supreme Court has said this is not a campaign ad because it makes no reference to an election. It doesn't state that, the, uh, that Senator Jones is a candidate. It doesn't say vote for or vote against. The Supreme Court has said this is an issue ad because it focuses on the issue of higher gasoline taxes. Now, the Supreme Court is, so these are not campaign ads. But the Supreme Court has also said that you can require disclosure if you have specific legislation doing that. If you have legislation which is narrowly tailored to serve a compelling state interest. On the federal level, we've done that. So there are electioneering statutes on the federal level, and they have survived uh, the scrutiny of the U.S. Supreme Court. What LB-8 does, it incorporates those concepts from the federal system into Nebraska's state system. So under LB-8, an electioneering communication is a communication which refers to a clearly identified candidate or ballot question. It occurs in the 30 days immediately prior to the election, and it's directed at the electorate that's going to vote on the candidate or ballot question. So in the case of Senator Jones of District 51, if the mailer is sent to the residents of District 51, that's what that particular provision means. Under current law, corporations, unions, limited liability companies, limited partnerships, and certain other associations report the money that they spend supporting or opposing candidates or ballot questions. Under LB-8, they would also report the money they spend on electioneering communications. Under current law, individuals and other types of entities report the money that they spend on independent expenditures supporting or opposing candidates or ballot questions. Under LB-8, they will also report the money that they spend on electioneering communications. And I think I want to put this in perspective here. Consider all of the commercial ads that you see on a daily basis. None of them say, buy our car, or drink our soft drink, or use our pharmaceutical product. What they do is they create images. They, and often it's happy people, smiling people using the product. But through these images, they are attempting to affect your buying decisions. Candidates will often do the same thing with their advertising. They create an image, a very positive image of themselves, which may include waving flags or smiling people. And what they are attempting to do is to affect your voting decisions. And that's exactly what many of these, uh, these uh, issue ads are, these electioneering communications are. They are attempts to affect your voting decision without actually saying vote for, vote against, or something of that nature. So ultimately, this bill requires those making electioneering communications to disclose who they are, how much they spent, and which candidate or ballot question was the subject of their electioneering communication, even if they don't say vote for or vote against. I think Senator Blood mentioned it, but it's important to mention again. This bill is not aimed at any particular person or philosophy or point of view. It doesn't go to the content of ads. It only goes to the disclosure of um, how much was spent. This bill does not in any way prevent anyone from engaging in campaign activity or engaging in electioneering communications. It merely shows uh, how much money was spent. 
So thank you, Senator Blood, for bringing this very important piece of legislation, and thank you, members of the committee, for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Questions, Senator McAllister. Yeah, thank you, Senator yeah. Sanders. Under the current statute, under consideration, it's only those expenditures 30 days before the election? That is correct. Wouldn't it be, some of those expenditures occur much before that 30-day period of time. Wouldn't it, wouldn't the legislation be improved if you extended that 30-day that period to 60 days or 90 days before the election? Potentially so. However, we're trying to deal with uh, the rulings of the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court has stated that it's constitutional to require disclosure of these ads 30 days before a primary and 60 days before a general election. So this is more narrow than what the Supreme Court has allowed. I think the idea is to be a bit conservative. I see. But other states, have they used that same 30-day period? Or have they not, extended out? I'm not sure what... No one's gone beyond 60 days for the general election, and I believe that's the case on the federal level. Uh, I'm not sure what other states have done for their time periods, but they've always tried to stay within the 30-day primary, 60-day general restriction. If we extended it to 60 days, would that be any operational difficulty for you and your staff? It would not. Thank you, Mr. Daly. Thank you. Senator Halloran. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Sanders. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm, trying, uh, I'm trying to discover exactly what, so the people that will be contributing to a uh, lobbying group we'll call them a lobbying group that puts out an ad that isn't currently exposed who funds them. They'll be ex those, those people that fund them will be exposed. Yes. And, no? Yeah, not necessarily. Okay. What this primarily requires is that the groups, whether it's a corporation or organization, will disclose how much they spent, who they are, and what candidate or ballot question was the subject of the uh, of the uh, communication? Their identity will be public. The identity right. of the entity that puts out the ad. Now, right. if that group solicits funds specifically for that ad, so we're the XYZ Association, and we're calling on our members to contribute an extra bit of money so we can put out this ad, Anyone that contributes more than $250 to that process, their identity would be disclosed. However, if they're just normal contributors to the organization for its general purposes, their identity would not be disclosed. So only if they're closely right. associated with the ad. Yeah, I understand that. But what I'm trying to understand is, uh, just call me dense, but I'm trying to understand uh, the benefit of that. I mean, who benefits from that? So the public? The public would. So the public is all going to run to the accountability and disclosure website and search through it to find out uh, who, who uh, finances these groups? What they would do is they would go to the Accountability and Disclosure Commission website and see that the XYZ organization spent $10,000 in legislative district 51 and the subject of okay. their ads was you so said so. it much you said it much more eloquently than I did but 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 we're expecting the public to do that because it's available to them and that's what you're that's what you're all about is mm -hmm. disclosing that information are people going to do that well they do it for candidates and political parties well, and I understand some people elections. will but yes. is that going to be a is that going to be something that the public is generally going to look at and say, or generally use in a, in a, in a, uh, with large numbers to find out that information? In some cases, the public will, but uh, part of the real benefit is that uh, the media looks at these things as well for the purposes of doing stories and so forth. So very often the media will have stories on who contributed to which candidate, who spent money opposing a candidate. And this can be part of those stories that a group called the XYZ organization spent $30,000 opposing Senator so-and-so. I think that's all great, and, and I understand that would give broader uh, publicity or exposure to the public on that information. If I had more confidence in the media would do the same for both sides of the equation. 
haven't seen that happen in the past, and, and that information has been available to the media, media for, for more progressive groups, and yet the detail about, which is available on your website, the detail is not, uh, is not broadcast or made an issue of by the press very often about the source of the funding, for example, for various groups. Doesn't happen. So, I mean, I, we're putting a lot of uh, confidence, in, 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 I think, in the media being uh, even-handed with that information to the public. Don't you agree that, well, I'm ask your opinion on that. That wouldn't be fair. But that's a concern I have. Certainly. Well, I suppose that the main consideration is if the information isn't available, no one's going to report it. If the information is available, there's at least the possibility that some people will take an interest and look at it, and maybe media will pick it up as well. But that's my concern. It's a remote possibility, depending on which side of the equation the media may favor. And, and, and that's the way it is. I mean, we're not going to change that. But I'm not sure, not confident that the media is going to be that e even-handed with it. But I appreciate your testimony. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senator. Senator McCollister. Yeah, thank you, Senator Sanders. In the example you used, Mr. Daly, XYZ Corporation, now if it, if it was a C3, would we know the individuals that contributed to the C3 versus the XYZ Corporation labor union that's a C4? I have to throw out a bit of a caveat here. Okay. 501C3, 501C4. Those are provisions of the Internal Revenue Code, and I don't claim to be a tax expert, so I have to be a little bit careful here. 501c3s typically are not involved in a lot of campaign activity because it potentially jeopardizes their tax-exempt status. 501c4s, there are a lot of different types of entities that fall under 501c4. They are simply nonprofit entities, and doesn't mean not taxable, so there's a wide range of activities they are involved in. However, if a 501c4 or any organization engaged in electioneering communications and the amount of the communication was more than $1,000, you wouldn't necessarily get the contribution list of that entity. You would only get a list of those contributors who gave money specifically for that electioneering communication. I see. So, if we're trying to provide disclosure on who made the contributions and they mask themselves or hide their identity under some other, some other name, we still haven't fixed that, have we? Not completely, no. We at least know that there's a group out there by the name of this, and it spent X number of dollars on electioneering communications, and the subject of the communication was this candidate or this ballot question. That's what we primarily receive under this bill. And so far, either federal or state, there's no vehicle by which we can get those identities. No, it's going to take legislation both on the state level and the federal level, because right now, uh, there are a number of organizations that, because of, back to the federal, uh, the Internal Revenue Code, uh, Section 527, they have the option to create themselves for a variety of purposes and only disclose certain things involving candidates, and they're available on the IRS website, and it's awfully hard to find. And so I think ultimately we need to assist move to a system in which anything which is a campaign contribution on the federal side has to be filed with the Federal Election Commission so that there's one place to look. Uh, anything that uh, is essentially a campaign expenditure, electioneering communication, is filed with the Accountability and Disclosure Commission so there's one place to look. Thank and you. I think we've mentioned, I think we've had conversations in the past that Ultimately, because of the patchwork of state legislation and federal legislation, which is not always the same, there are a lot of avenues for money to flow without detection. This is one step toward detecting at least the amounts of some of that money. Thank you. Senator Lowe. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Mr. Daly, for being here. Um, 
since we're using the alphabet companies today, and we have the XYZ company that um, puts out the flyer, what's stopping uh, a corporate, a large uh, um, partisan uh, individual or company, uh, either which way, um, from creating sub companies underneath it, and then those sub companies give to XYZ, mm -hmm. where nobody really knows where the money comes from then at that point in time because it just goes back to those sub companies. That's correct. That's correct. So are we accomplishing anything? I mean, the companies or the individuals will just get smarter and smarter as we move down this path? You know, you can play hide the ball and then hide the ball and then hide the ball. And I suppose that at some point when you're trying to figure out what the, where the ball is, you have to at least take that first step. And this is one of them. But you are absolutely correct that what will be disclosed will be the entity that made the electioneering communication, how much, and what candidate or ballot question was the subject of the communication, which frankly is more than we have now. So it will be basically the postage, the, the cost of the card to put it out. Sure, um, sure. We spent $30,000 on electioneering communications, and the subject of the communication was Senator Jones. Will it have that communication as noted on that one? I mean, because... Yeah, so we'll know... When I ran in 2016, I had cards coming out against me every day of the week. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So will it pinpoint each one of those days and have what it says on those cards? Or? I think I think potentially we can get there through the rulemaking process, but uh, the legislation doesn't specifically require that, what you're going to get are who, the amount, and who is the subject. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Are there others? See none. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Senator Sanders and members of the committee. Are there any other proponents? See none. Opponent. Neutral. Closing, Senator Blood. And um, there were no written testimony opponent. We had an opponent, Spike Eckhart, with the ACLU of Nebraska. So let's see if I can unpack some of the questions that have yet to be answered here. Um, Senator McAllister, the states that I found in, in my research that have dark money legislation, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Delaware, Florida, Idaho, Maryland, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Missouri, Montana, New Jersey, New York, New Mexico, Oregon, Rhode Island, South Dakota, Texas, Vermont, and Washington. I think that adds up to 21. Um, I want to thank Senator Halloran for actually bringing up preserving the good life because much as I said, like I said in my opening, this is not a Republican or a Democrat issue. This is an issue that all of us have, I'm guessing, have had to deal with in many of our elections. And that's the entire point of this bill. Um, you know, you talked about the eye of the beholder um, and that voters are probably smarter than we give them credit, to, credit for. Well, voters are smart and they do do their research. But I can tell you, especially in the last 30 days, um, because I'm sure Senator Sanders can say the same thing. We've lived in our community for so long when people get stuff like that in the mail, be it for your campaign or others, they call to ask you if it's true. I can tell you with dark money that there was a female candidate who was accused of being pro-abortion. And I know for a fact that that woman became pregnant in college and gave her child up for adoption. That's a pretty hurtful thing. But they have that right legally to say whatever they want to say. But she should have the right to know who the hell is saying it. And her, the people who wanted to vote for her or did vote for her, they have the right to know who puts out trash like this. I know another candidate that it was in reference that supposedly they, they um, were against guns and letting criminals out on the streets. 
letting pedophiles and sex offenders out on the streets, and that candidate had been brutally sexually assaulted. That person has the right to know who's putting out garbage. And the voters have the right to know who is putting out that garbage. They still have the right to say that, but the voters should be able to see who's behind it. Voters don't want dark money. They don't want people behind closed doors telling them how they should or should not vote without actually saying those words, I might add. They deserve to know. It's brutal, and you've already said it. It's been used against you as well, and that doesn't, that's not right. I don't care if you're a Republican. I don't care if you're a Democrat. This is about having good government, and to think otherwise is, quite frankly, stupid. Several decades ago, I mean, I grew up in Nebraska. I grew up in the same area that Senator Halloran grew up in. Um, transparency in political spending, it really was the norm in Nebraska elections. And the trend towards secrecy appears to be escalating based on this last election cycle. So the rising tide of dark money, it, it really ought to be a bipartisan concern. And I don't understand why we can never vote this bill out of committee so we can have a debate. We have committees that keep, bills that keep coming in front of this committee and others that have already had debate on the floor and they didn't get passed. But yet we have to keep listening um, to it year after year after year. And I'm okay with that. But I want to know what you guys are scared of, why you can't vote this out on the floor. And I will tell you that people use NADC all the time. Because I can look at my social media when I had the, the, the meat bill and the, the uh, people who felt that their rights to eat um, vegetarian and vegan were, were being discriminated against. They pointed out that the Nebraska Farmers Union gave me $100. You know, because that big donation really influenced me to protect Nebraska's number one industry, which is cattle. So to think that they don't use it, they do use it. They make it public record. They want to try and expose who gives you money. So sometimes they do it for greater good. Sometimes they do it just to be jerks. But people do use the NADC site, and they do get information from it. And I think they do have, you should have the right to reply. If somebody says that, that you let pedophiles and sex offenders out on the street, if somebody says that you want to take away everybody's guns, and that's a lie or a half-truth, you should have the right to respond because the voters should know what the truth is. And if you think otherwise, then, then I want to know what you're scared of. This deserves debate. When we were talking today and I was listening to some of the questions, a Jonathan Swift quote came to mind. A lie can travel around the world and back again while the truth is still lacing up its boots. Why is it a big deal to ask any organization such as this that, that deal with dark money to do anything differently than everybody else has to do that's involved in the campaign. What makes them so special? I think I know the answer. There's people that are sitting in our body that probably wouldn't be here without that dark money, which is okay. But let's find out who's behind it, because the voters have the right to know. With that, if you have additional questions, I'm happy to answer them. Senator Halloran. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Sanders. That was almost, you know, in sales they call that a silent close. It's very effective, I might add, where you pause for about 20 seconds before you say, I, you know, would like to uh, be available for questions. Isn't I'm not afraid of it. I'm not speaks a, first loses? Isn't that the next part of that? Pretty much. Yeah. So. Um, at, at risk of being the person that speaks first. Um, we call it dark money and we can call it dark money and that's a very, uh, you know, clearly uh, onerous and negative connotation that that has, but I've seen a lot of enlightened money 
put out a lot of nasty ads. Absolutely. A lot of nasty ads. So it really Absolutely. doesn't make, it really doesn't have, it doesn't have a preventive or prohibitive effect on the nature of the ads. We know who those ads come from and it's exactly. enlightened money. But enlightened or darkened money, it happens. And we, it may happen in the last two weeks and we still, even if it's enlightened money from groups that I can list off, some of them have lobbyists. Some of them have lobbyists that are 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 paid public employee um, employees of unions, uh, who who are uh, treasurers of these groups that mm -hmm. put out the money. It's enlightened money. We have all that information. We know that information. Right. But you're making the point for the bill, Senator. Well, but what difference does it make? It That's makes a big point. difference. It makes a big difference when say that. Um, I, I don't want to call out any group specifically. So let's say that ABC gun activist group comes out against you. Um, well, we'll say they'll, they'll come in support of you. How about that? We'll make it nice. ABC comes out in support of you because you are pro-gun. We know by looking at ABC group on NADC that, of course, they come out in support of you because that's, they want to make sure that nobody takes away their guns. But say that um, XYZ group comes out against you and says that um, you aren't pro-life because you happen to not vote for one of the um, anti-abortion bills because you thought it was problematic in the language. But they're not going to tell anybody that it was problematic in the language. They're just going to say that you voted against it. Shouldn't the Catholics, and you live in a, a very strong Catholic area, shouldn't those Catholics have the ability to find out that, that this group is purposely trying to misrepresent who you are and what you did? Should they be able to see the name of who did it? Exactly, Senator. But what I'm saying, a lot of the enlightened money, money that has the light shed on it about who funds it, does the same thing. And it's And wrong. it doesn't stop. Well, it, it's wrong. And it's wrong, And but you have the right with the enlightened money to see who they but are. But it doesn't stop anything, Senator, does it? How does it stop anything? I'll put it in the form How does it question. stop anything? Yeah. So it allows the voters to see who the jerks are behind doing that. It allows the voters to see, it allows the media to see, and it allows the candidate to see who is behind it so they can fight back. Don't you have the right as a candidate to fight back? Sure I do, but if it happens within the 30 days, whether it's enlightened money that casts doubt on my campaign or dark money, it doesn't matter. I don't have enough time, probably don't have enough money. So why shouldn't all organizations be transparent, I guess would be my question. So I'm well, a little troubled by your question. Well, that, they're supposed to be troubling, I guess, but the, the questions are, I think, uh, the question is what difference will it make to me as a candidate or to the public to know uh, who is behind the uh, enlightened money or the dark money? Because I have, had, I have had money spent against my campaigns by enlightened money, well-lit money, and they still did it. And it, right. was, and, it, and it was misleading as, as any of the dark money uh, campaigns that you're talking about. But we know who they are. Well, that's fine. I, you know, it's I, nice. I, I guess the, the answer I would have is right is right, wrong is wrong. It is wrong to allow people to have special exceptions when everybody else has to have an even playing field. Right is right, wrong is wrong. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Are there any other questions? Senator Love. No, thank you. And thank you, Carol, for bringing the bill. Senator Blood. Thank you, Senator Blood. Sorry. What did I say? Carol. Oh, Carol. I'm sorry, Senator. Truly. But as I brought it up to um, Director Daly, um, if there are shells to these corporations, you really don't know who is doing it. Sure. When you lift up a rock, the cockroaches go running. That's true. That's exactly what happens. But that is not a reason for us to not try and put forward good policy to show that it is not acceptable. To sh you have to start somewhere, Senator Lowe. And we can't keep saying, well, you know, we took a bite out of this apple, but we're done with it, and now we're going to throw it away because we can't possibly finish it. It's too big. You, it's, we've got to start somewhere. And, and you said it yourself. You know, you had some pretty negative campaigns used against you, too. I, I can't stress enough that this isn't a party thing. 
You know, I'm sure I'm making people mad on both sides right now. And quite frankly, both sides don't want us to have legislation like this because it's their their tool in a toolbox to to win elections in the last 30 days. But does that make it right? Does that make it ethical? And by us saying, well, it's not going to fix the, the whole problem, I said that in my opening. It's not a panacea. But I am just really sick and tired of us saying, ah, it's never going to fix it. It's not constitutional. Well, obviously it is. 21 other states have done this, right? I'm sick of the same sad old excuses. Then with all due respect, are we ever going to show some guts? I have heard so much whiny crybaby stuff on, on this type of legislation. It is time to man up. And I don't mean to sound sexist, but it's time to man up and do something about it. Because we've never had a debate on this. And I, again, I keep saying this. What are we scared of? Why, why can't we at least discuss it on the floor? And if it doesn't pass, it doesn't pass. But I think Nebraskans, if you were to pull your, your, your district, they're going to tell you that they want to know who's paying for these ads. And I can tell you that morally, it makes me really sad when I've heard some of the stories, such as the person who gave away their child and the person who was brutally sexually assaulted, and that those types of ads came out against them and they didn't have the right to fight back, right? That's, that's, that's immoral. So maybe my brain works differently than other people's. But I, I feel like this is something we should be fighting for. This is a bipartisan issue. Why can't we all come to terms on something like this? And to say, you know, come up with examples of, well, or, you know, people are smarter, they're really going to look. And yeah. I always say, will and can, right? Will they look? I don't know. Should, can they look? Yeah, they should have the ability to look and have that information. And, you know, as far as the media, I think it depends on what part of the state you live in, too. Like, I think media goes towards the demographic that's in their immediate area. Sometimes it's more conservative, sometimes it's not as conservative. But again, that's not why we write legislation. We write legislation for the betterment of Nebraskans. This is for the betterment of Nebraska voters. And again, you, Senator Lowe, as a candidate, you should have the right to fight back. And, and it isn't too late in 30 days to fight back. You can have a press conference. You can take over social media, right? There's so much that you can do. But at the very least, you should be able to step on that cockroach that crawls out from under that rock, right? But if it's a shell, you're just stepping on the shell and the bug is gone. Yeah, well... Again, unethical people are going to continue to be unethical. And as, as I said in my opening, this is not a panacea, but it's a start. And we should start. And by saying, again, I'm sorry, and I don't mean this in a condescending way, it's more excuses. When are we going to stop making excuses and just bite the bullet and move forward? All right. Thank you. Are there any other questions? See none. For the record, LB8 position letters, 10 proponent, 2 opponents, 0 neutral. Thank you for closing. This Thank ends you all. the hearing on LB8.